So uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome G. William Dalmoff, uh, who goes by Bill, uh, to the Political Economy Workshop. Um, he is currently Distinguished Professor Emeritus of, and Research Professor of Psychology and Sociology at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Um, you know, he did his undergraduate at Duke, where he played baseball. Uh, I've been told. I thought you're going to keep this short. <laughs> it is going to be short, but I just want to throw in a couple of these things. Uh, I will keep it short. Uh, but I've also been told he was an incredible basketball player. Uh, I've heard from several people. So uh, we have a, at least uh, some of us have an interest in basketball in this political economy workshop. Uh, <laughs> Robert Pollan. You, Bob Paul, and you might know, is, uh, uh, has an interest in basketball as well. Um, and actually uh, has his PhD in psychology, not in sociology. And amazingly, we're, I'm going to talk about his, uh, you know, he'll, the, he's doing a presentation, and I'm just going to talk about his work in political economy. But he has an entire other research trajectory in the study of dreams, which I find utterly amazing. Okay, he's been so amazingly productive and done such important work and basically has had two totally separate careers. Just kind of blows my mind. Yeah. Um, for my money, you know, and I know this is my opinion, I think Bill is the most important social scientist working in the U.S. Uh, because of his work on the distribution of power. Um, and theoretically, he's kind of a combination of, um, or somewhere between Marxian and institutionalist thought. Um, and I think is one of the most foremost practitioners of power structure research, uh, uh, which I'm trying to teach to people at UMass. And I would like to become a major methodology that's, uh, that's utilized in economics. Um, uh, and I think what really distinguishes Bill's work um, on the distribution of uh, power in the US or what Marxists might call theories of the state would be another way uh, to put it, is his Im incredible empirical rigor. Uh, now that I've joined an econ department, I know I'm sounding like I'm going on too long. I'll, I'll wrap it up. But I've noticed the incredible rigor, which is uh, lavished on econometrics. But if you're not doing econometrics, basically anything goes. And <laughs> there's like, a, like no conceptions of rigor outside of econometrics. And I think Bill really demonstrates in such a great way how you could, it's hard, it's hard to be rigorous when you're not using statistics, but the ability to test competing hypotheses, which most people just don't even bother to do. It's really hard to do outside of econometrics, but Bill does it brilliantly. Um, uh, so that's why I, I really love his work. Um, he's best known and probably most of you know his work, uh, his book, Who Rules America? Uh, first published in 1967. And the eighth edition is coming out soon. Uh, so that's Who Rules America, The Corporate Rich, White Nationalist Republicans, and Inclusionary Democrats. Uh, Bill's written many other books and articles. Some of the most famous were The Higher Circles, uh, The Powers That Be, uh, The Diversity in the Power Elite, or my personal favorite, The Power Elite and the State. Um, much of his work is based on archival work. Uh, such as his last book, The Corporate Rich and the Power Elite in the 20th Century, How They Won, Why Liberals and Labor Lost. Uh, uh, and that came out in 2019. And I could go on and on introducing him, but I, uh, he asked me to be brief. So that's as brief as I could be uh, <laughs> when I'm introducing <laughs> one of my greatest intellectual heroes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Larry. Um... Uh, for uh, for asking me to do this, for arranging it, um, uh, for DVA, I asked for a very short introduction. That it's not what I got, <laughs> so uh, it maybe loosens me up a little bit. I am an empiricist. I do follow my nose. I do have a quantitative bent. Uh, my work on dreams that he mentioned is quantitative content analysis of um, of dream reports, and the title of my a dissertation tells it all, a quantitative study of dream content using an objective indicator of dreaming. You can see how defensive that is in terms of 
saying, look, where is in dreams collected in REM sleep in the lab and we're quantifying them. And I would say in that regard that um, I think there's two basic methods in power structure research and they are network analysis and, and content analysis. The network analysis in effect takes us to the key organizations and to the key people in those organizations. And then we st study the output of those organizations of, and of those persons. Um, and this is the tradition of uh, Floyd Hunter, who was a, a great sociologist that got pushed aside by the pluralist and also of C. Wright Mills. Um, and they've really started with organizations and built from there. Organizations, division of labor, a tremendous efficiencies, tremendous productivity, but um, the uh, people at direct organizations have a tremendous strategic advantage and they soon dominate these organizations. Social psychology takes over. They think they're wonderful and they soon eliminate power rivals. Uh, and so on. So it's hard to keep organizations at all accountable. And so we have this paradox that on the one hand, um, they've, they've changed the uh, uh, um, you know, material wealth, the collective ability to, to worship together, uh, lots of kinds of things. But at the same time, um, they lead to uh, the solidification of power structures that are very difficult um, to, to dislodge. So, um, and my interests are totally separate out of totally different curiosities. And they're just a matter of the zeitgeist in terms of when you come online. And when I came online in the late fifties and early sixties, there was first of all, the discovery of a kind of sleep, REM sleep, that seemed to be the only time we were dreaming. Wow, that's exciting. That's like uh, Pedro and, and Caitlin, they're coming online at a certain time, certain things look more interesting. And secondly, shortly after that, and with my, I guess, personal dispositions and all, um, having spent some time at Duke in the uh, segregated South, um, I was really uh, enthused by and taken by the, uh, 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 so the uh, uh, SNCC in particular, the, uh, the civil rights movement. And that's what got me into power structure uh, research because I thought, well, I can do some empirical research that allows me to compare what um, the various viewpoints uh, say. So it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. Um, but I do, I did come to it as an innocent in the sense of that baseball is relevant because I was never interested in politics, I must confess, until um, I was in my 20s, already married family teaching. I started teaching as a professor in 1962. So I've been around the bend for a long, a long, long time. Um, there's three parts to my talk today. I want to first give a sense of where I think we are now, both in terms of power and in terms of, of uh, those who challenge power. Um, the second thing I want to try to do is to give a quick explanation of of how I think we got to that situation. And um, that'll be in a way the longest part of, of the talk. And the third thing that I, I wanna talk about is uh, um, what are the factors that will be involved in um, the elections in 22 and 2024? 20, Basically, here's what I think the uh, variables are. Um, I don't think we know what's gonna happen. I don't think you can predict the future. Um, and I think we're, I say in my 2022 book on who rules, I think we're, we're walk on a razor's edge. It could go uh, either way. And lots of little things can then tip it when it's so close. Um, is it any one of a million variables um, that can uh, change things? So um, at, at that, that point then where we are now, um, I think, uh, and then we can put the title up now if you would, Pedro. So the title of my talk uh, is Setting the Stage, uh, namely we're, we're in this situation of having uh, a white nationalist group against an inclusionary group. We have a tremendously powerful uh, corporate rich. And I'm gonna try to explain that in terms of, of this concept of a corporate rich that dominates a caste system in America and what happened um, to the unions. 
Okay, moving away from that slide. Oh, that's right, I'm still up here. So the, the point now is that I really do draw on a lot of historical archival research, as well as network analysis. And I've interviewed and um, we've been out looked and, you know, participant, obs not participant observation, but, but observation. Um, and I think uh, a, a lot of work is brought together in that corporate rich book. And I did ask Larry to mention the title. I think uh, the corporate rich won. And I think we can under, and I know, I think I know how they won. Um, but I say why liberals and labor's lost, labor and lost, because I, I think that um, uh, some flaws in the liberal labor, labor coalition did matter big time. And then the Who Rules America book, just for its uh, subtitle, because once again, we have a corporate rich, we have now a white nationalist Republican party where we used to have a white nationalist Democratic party. And now we have a, an inclusionary, the Democratic party. Um, I think that the corporate rich are gonna to continue to dominate this country, whether it becomes an authoritarian, um, ethno-nationalist, what I'd call a white supremacist, supremacist democracy, quote, or whether it becomes an inclusionary uh, democracy. Um, but at the, strain, at the same time, I don't know for sure where they're going to go in the 20s. I don't have good guesses. And I also don't think they could fully um, uh, control it if they were quite united in and uh, were really trying to push in one direction or another. They might be able to to uh, influence that, but I think it's much bigger forces that are operating in terms of, of people's identity, uh, um, lower classes in the society and so on. So I, I do think we're in a, a, a very um, unusual kind of, of moment. So my, my general explanation will be around this concept of corporate rich, which is one that Mills developed to talk about the fact that they're really had been with the rise of these big corporations that executives, usually from the middle upper middle classes, some from the upper class, they really have melded very much with the, with the owners. Um, and so he talked of a, a corporate rich. And so I'm gonna explain things in terms of corporate rich and also a leadership group I call a power elite, drawing on Mills, but defining it differently because I think it's a leadership group that's uh, rooted in the uh, corporate rich, but it's not just the corporate rich. It's not just the capitalists um, that we're, we're, we're talking about. So I, I want to um, uh, explain that at the current moment. And then I want to talk about, and that'll be a most talky part about how I think we got there. Uh, and I'm going to highlight sort of a power version of history, which will leave out a lot of history. And then very briefly, I will talk about these factors of where uh, we, we uh, might go. Um, I will try to uh, refrain from the academic tendency to want to give too many examples and to uh, uh, be nuanced and, and uh, make sure you know that I know there's a lot of variables and so on. I hope we can do that in our discussion. And I like the size of the group for, for that um, a very kind of, of uh, of reason. I do want to say I have been in a lot of archives and it's been a lot of fun. It's like rerunning, you know, things I lived through, I now read about in archives. Um, and so I, and I have found some, some new things. I'm, I'm really proud that I found like in the <laughs> a, a, a electricity museum or whatever it's called in Schenectady and I'm down in the basement. It's a very minor archive. <laughs> I'm reading letters between the uh, from sent by the head of General Electric to the head of Standard Oil of New Jersey, Exxon Mobil, today. And so it's kind of, uh, you know, fun and, and new. And I read all the Rockefeller archive stuff that came available um, as it came available over the years. And also uh, read a man named Gittleman on, on uh, the Rockefeller uh, kind of, of involvements. So at all times for me, then the issue will be one of power, um, uh, political sociology. And you'll hear me talk about uh, indicators of power. That's how do we infer that somebody is powerful. 
Um, and basically there are who benefits, who has the goodies. And then, then from there, you try to understand who, how they got them. Um, well, I'll also talk about, well, who sits in the pe seats of power and explain how that works. And then I'm gonna look at uh, uh, indicators that are called who wins. That is, if there's a conflict over something, who is triumphant um, in that uh, particular uh, conflict. So um, that's the general overview. Now um, I'm gonna turn to, the, um, to uh, the next slide. It's a who benefits kind of slide. This is from uh, Edward Wolf's work, uh, Century of Wealth. Um, it's the financial wealth. And as you know, he defines that in terms of it, basically uh, not durable goods, not the house you live in. Um, it's, it's more uh, liquid kind of assets. And if we start uh, on the right and go clockwise, we can see that 1% in 2013, I think it was, yeah, had 43%. The next 4%, we had another, we're at 77%. Uh, um, the next 5%, we're at 85%. And then the next 10%, we're at uh, 95%. So huge huge disparities in wealth, 80% uh, have 5%. If we, if we talk in social class terms, the upper class does half a percent, the upper middle class, probably another 15, 16%. Skilled work uh, people um, who have been able to cred credentialize their um, occupation, uh, keep people out. Uh, mostly males keep women out of these skilled trades. They do everything they can to do that. Um, we, we get a picture here of, I think, the, uh, the wealth distribution in the United States. Uh, it has uh, become uh, more unequal over the last 40, 50 years, but it was always pretty unequal. And more generally, those of you know, the work of Piketty and Stays and um, Zuckman and others in that group, um, it, it fluctuates with whether there's war, whether it's depression, um, so in good times, they, they uh, when calm times, I would say, they, um, it all accumulates uh, uh, to the top. So the next slide, we'd, we'd see this through income, uh, taking again from that same uh, a group of researchers. If we look at the share of pre-tax income that's held by the top 1% versus the top 50%, uh, or the bottom 50%, excuse me, you see this uh, dramatic uh, kind of change. I don't need to give the exact numbers to keep, keep myself on a little bit of a schedule here, uh, but you can see it's dramatically uh, uh, changed. Now let's look at this in just regular 2018 dollars in the next slide, if uh, we would. You can see that, the, uh, as you all know, uh, basically workers in America the, the now indexed by uh, not a uh, four-year college education. They've been making about 19 grand a year for a long, long time. Uh, meanwhile, it's gone out of sight for the top 1%. And if we broke this down, which we could, but I didn't, I don't quite have the resources anymore, plus the energy, um, plus people to work with to, to get really fancy, which I think much better job, of course, could be done on this. But you can see what, what has happened. Um, so power is accumulating even more. This is examples of the corporate rich uh, winning. Okay, well, if all these, if these indicators suggest that there's this 1%, or it's actually, I'd say a half percent, three tenths of a percent, uh, is the real uh, uh, ownership class, the real upper class. How does this happen? Let's go to the next uh, slide then. And I think it happens through a leadership group. And it draws from three, uh, we put it in a Venn diagram, it's three, three overlapping uh, uh, groups. Um, these would be Mills's higher circle, so to speak. Uh, if we start on the, uh, on the left, it's obviously this corporate community that I'll define more that's, that's really the starting point. And the corporate community is very large in terms of vice presidents, middle level executives, uh, CEOs, boards of directors. But a lot of those people are not 
uh, part of the power elite. They are, they may, those vice presidents may someday, a 35 year old vice president may, when he's 55 or she's 55, may be on the board of directors, may be a CEO. But right now they are not in a leadership group. So people move in and out. And then on the top, you see the social upper class. And these, these are the, the owners, uh, the, the big wealthy. Um, and here I stress that, you know, a lot of them are socialites. A lot of them are jet setters. If we got more nuance, there are ones that fail. Um, they, they get hooked on drugs. They uh, do whatever. Uh, but there are also some change agents in that group. There are people who have uh, uh, really in a way gone over to the other side. I've interviewed such people. Um, they maintain their class style and manner, but they support they the ones I have interviewed. Um, but they also support uh, other causes. But some of those people are active uh, in the corporate world or they're act active as experts or uh, serve on boards of trustees of the groups I'm going to get to. Uh, so they, they really are actively involved in, in trying to uh, generate policy. And then on the right, you see what I call a policy planning network. And I think this is a nice example of network analysis. And in effect, I stumbled on this network just by in the 60s by writing down people's names and all their connections. And then in effect, or you read a million who's who biographies and you start to say, geez, they're all in organization X or what's organization Y. Now we can do that. We can generate that we can affect test the hypothesis by putting all um, all of the people and organizations in a big network and i think this is what you come up with in fact i have such a a, a um, analysis on my website who rules america.net for, for um, data from about 2011 that has uh, 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 fortune 500 plus uh, several other thousand, couple thousand other corporations. Then we said, okay, what happens? You put in the directors of various of, um, uh, foundations or think tanks, and bang, you find out which ones uh, have that uh, overlap. So I, I think that this is the uh, general picture of the power structure. Uh, you can then map it with uh, uh, great care. Uh, you can look more closely at things. You can look at the, there are a lot of companies, for instance, here I'm straying a little, um, you know, that are privately held. Well, are there directors? Are some of those people directors of, of Fortune 500 fir firms? Yes, they are. Are they on these board of trustees for these nonprofits? Yes, they are. Uh, and so on. So you can build out and you can also find out you know, who's on the periphery, who's excluded, who's not there, uh, and, and so on. You can look at these social clubs, for example, and you'll find that people of certain religious backgrounds are not um, included, uh, that they are treated badly at prep schools, and they will speak of that uh, if you interview them. And I think it has an effect on what their politics are. And I interviewed one man once who said, I'm on a board with a bunch of fascists. He said, but I, I choose to use my money to do different things. And I, uh, I'm a very liberal Democrat. So um, those other identities matter. Okay, so that's the, what the power look, elite looks like. Now I wanna turn to you know, more nitty gritty of how they govern. And since it's a small informal group, and I'm, I'm, I guess I've found my comfort mode, my mojo's back. I wanna say that basically, there, there's four avenues through which uh, we can really trace in detail how that power lead operates. And this is the second of the four, so I might as well go in the right order. And that is, we all know about uh, the interest group process. And uh, we know there's uh, you know, the American Petroleum Institute and the Home Builders Association and uh, Union X and Union Y and and the Good Government League and you know, the groups that help the seniors, they're all interest groups. Um, so there is the, uh, what I call the special interest process. And you know, there's been thousands of studies, not maybe 10,000 right now. They show exactly how it works. Uh, the use of lobbyists, hiring people that used to be in government, uh, hire former staffers, 
high sh hot shot lawyers. Um, it's going on right now, of course, over um, the Biden's uh, infrastructure bills. Um, that kind of thing, it looks out for short run interests. Um, one uh, sociologist called the uh, wealth defense industry. <laughs> They're always finding new loopholes, always finding new ways to, um, to carve out exceptions. Uh, for their um, their industry or for individual families and so on. I think that matters, but um, famous guy of the past, Grant McConnell, political scientist, who, who, who wrote a, a book on private power and American democracy, pointed out most of the government is carved up into these smaller parts, but he said there's no overarching. There's no bigger picture. Um, I think there is a bigger picture. And I think that uh, Grant McConnell, who was once a colleague of mine, somebody I learned a lot from, I think he and a lot of others don't take seriously the policy planning network. Um, and so I, I got it up here. Corporate rich, you know, they get their money from major corporations. They start foundations. I could hear say here that major corporations also create foundations and they finance think tanks, policy discussion groups. They talk in those areas. And, and the way it happens is this. I'm, I'm a, a guy that runs a company in uh, the, uh, northern New York. And, but I, and, I, and they're sitting in a discussion group in New York. And they're saying, we got to talk about Canadian policy. And the guy says, hey, I know this guy, Joe, up above. I went to prep school with him. Or I knew him from summer this or summer that. Let's see if he'd be interested. At that point, he might say, no, I'm not interested. I like running this business. Or he might say, okay, I'll come down for that particular discussion group. He or she may not like that. In other words, there's deselection. Or they may say, this person does not uh, forward a discussion. And you probably have known this for interactions in the faculty. Uh, we are interacting with people in the science division. You're going to interact with students. And you say, I don't think Frank's the guy we ought to send. You know, I mean, pretty sort out. This this person is good inside, and he's a good economist, but no, I don't think he's for faculty governance. So it's a very, in that sense, a very informal social psychological process. But these people are learning beyond just their narrow uh, business world, and they're being taught by these experts from think tanks. Maybe you're spending a year at Brookings, but maybe your whole life you've been trying to figure out one thing while you're at Brookings or the Urban Institute or whatever, you're educating these uh, corporate people on their larger issues. Um, they then serve on blue ribbon commissions that have been set up by the government, task forces for government. Um, they uh, testify to congressional committees and they do end up appointed to um, um, the executive branch of the federal government done a million studies of what are the backgrounds uh, socially and educationally, occupationally of the people appointed the cabinet. And they're all, I would say, they're, they're mostly from the policy planning people. <laughs> but I think it's important. Um, I also think social cohesion is important. And that's where the schools, the clubs, trust. People don't trust each other easily. Uh, you know, they're human, they in group and out group. And you're from Texas, I'm from New York. You're from one religion, I'm from another. How do we get a comfort level to then talk about these policies? I think all that matters, many people know. But I think that's, this is the second pro process. Here, I now I'll just show you the third process. Or no, first, before I, this is perfect. Go back to, go back, Pedro, go ahead, yeah. Here's the most important things they've done. You've all heard that phrase, state building, uh, state state leaders supposedly build the state. I say state building mostly happens by the corporate rich. These are all based on case studies, these things I've thrown up here. The first one was the Federal Trade Commission. But uh, I think the key ones for us, if you look at the uh, uh, AAA, Agricultural Adjustment Act, Social Security Administration, we've got the papers, we've got the oral histories. I've looked at all of those papers. And I think I can trace practically month by month just how it happened. Um, so I, I think they built those. I, I think case studies were done on the um, Employment Act of 46 that showed uh, business leaders led to the Council on, uh, of Economic Advisors. And I've studied the Council of Economic Advisors and published something in 87, who goes on and off and where do they come from? Um, you know, so you, you go on as a minor person from an academic background, 
And maybe you come out and you're on a corporate board or you move up or now you're asked to be at the Brookings Institution. So, so uh, they're all part of, of a whole complex thing. Um, I'd like to jump to to 62 and 74. Oh, go, you, sorry, sorry, Pedro. Um, Pedro's role is to try to guess what I'm going to say next. So he, it's, it's a, a tricky role he has, uh, but we talked about it beforehand. But the Trade Expansion Act of, uh, of 62 and then I think 74, I forget what they called it, but they created that Office of, of Trade Representatives and it's called Special Trade Representatives. It's very important. It's got a fair amount of autonomy and it's really led to pro key parts of the project of, uh, of expanding uh, American foreign trade. And I think, you know, just jump down to the bottom here. Uh, I think that uh, it was essentially uh, a very important part of the Office of, of Special Trade Representative. A very important role was its advisory committees in creating NAFTA and creating the World Trade Organization. And I would add uh, permanent uh, normal trade relations with China, which essentially uh, finished a project that had been begun, begun in the policy planning network between 39 and 42 that said in the post-World War, post -World War II world, we've got to expand. It's got to be an international economy. And as part of that, and this will be important later, we've got to open our economy. We've got to, we're the biggest market. If, these, if there's going to be capitalism in Europe and Japan uh, and Southeast Asia, they got to they got to have us as trading partners and they're, it's, it's compatible, simpatico. Very important economists of those days, but uh, one of the key ones being Alvin Hansen, who must be somebody, you know, from economic history, um, uh, a convert to Keynesian, we could call him uh, quite a guy. Uh, he, he was key part of all of this. And he talks about, well, yeah, I've read his papers and he'll say, well, we, we'll talk about this at our meeting at the Council on Foreign Relations and we'll meet with so-and-so. He spent a lot of time during World War II talking back and forth with Keynes, for instance. So that's uh, uh, enough of uh, why I think this uh, uh, policy planning network is important. And let's, let's go to our next slide here. And this next slide is a quickie. This is the... Uh, the fourth of the pro processes through which the uh, corporate rich dominate, they have enormous apparatus to try to shape public opinion. The, the key takeaway is that the general beliefs of the public have not changed. They're, they're a little more liberal on economic issues. They're less hardline on, on uh, foreign policy issues than, than what you find in the policy planning network. Uh, and they have different kinds of organizations to interact with different people. There's these upper middle class discussion groups that come out of the Foreign Policy Association, uh, UN Association, and they deal with attentive publics. Um, they try to go through um, uh, the um, corporate affairs department of, of each corporation, uh, create very benign PR kind of groups uh, that reach average citizens that put good stuff about the um, corporation in the newspaper and all of that kind of thing. But there's also uh, dark uh, side uh, PR groups. They are disruptive groups and they disrupt activists. Uh, they plant stories against people. They uh, besmirch the names of journalists. Um, they, they do that kind of, of, of research. I think they have their biggest impact on specific legislation because most people don't know the details of the legislation. And so what they, one book is called Merchants of Doubt, uh, because that's what they sell is doubt. Science is be, built on a consensus. And so they say there's no consensus and they find a, a you know, has been or never was who's on the margins of a field and uh, make him or her a public spokesperson. Um, this has been studied very carefully in the case of uh, Exxon Mobil's huge network. It's now uh, run by ultra conservatives. Um, Exxon Mobil and so on have gotten themselves at more in the background. But there is that attempt by them. And it, it floods the uh, uh, it floods the airwaves and uh, everything else. Benign groups like the Ad Council. Um, people start pollution. People can stop it. 
not externalities, you understand, people start pollution. And uh, so they have all these clever ad campaigns, including one I really like, while the pandemic is going on and nobody get a job, they say, maybe it's time for you to think of a new profession. Why don't you learn something new? Like blame the victim, get out there and learn something new. It's your fault. So I, I think there's a lot of that that goes on, how successful it is, I don't know. And from my point of view, the way that Congress works, it's very hard for general public opinion to have an impact anyhow. Okay, let's go to uh, the next slide. Okay, here's where we are right now. Um, that was the power side of it. This is pie charts of who were the Trump voters? How much did they contribute? Um, and if we start on the right with the Trump voters, we, we see a white um, a party. And we see a white non-college educated party. White non-college educated people contribute 58% of the, the Republican vote. Um, college educated um, white people can uh, contribute 27% of the, the um, uh, Trumpian vote. There's a small um, black percent there. There's a larger Latino percent. That larger Latino percent matters, I think, in Florida greatly. And I think it matters um, in Texas and mattered along the um, Texas border. Um, and, and Asian American Pacific Island vote, uh, I think people, that, uh, older people that came from China or came from uh, Vietnam are often uh, more Republican voters, uh, both because of, of thinking, you know, equating communism and liberalism, but also because some of them were quite well educated and, and wealthy. When we look at the Democrats, we see a, a multi color, multi ethnic, multi racial, you name it, those things. It is definitely now, as of 2018 and 2020, an inclusionary coalition. But what I'd want to stress to you is it depends tremendously on a white vote. 61% uh, roughly of Biden voters were white. And that includes the, uh, the uh, people that aren't college educated. And they matter because they're a big percentage of the, of the, uh, of the whole um, uh, electorate. So one two percentage point change in them is a lot. And I think uh, Biden-Harris got, I think, a percentage point or so more. That matter. Um, and the other thing that's happening, of course, is uh, the college educated whites um, uh, contribute a large percentage to the, uh, the Democratic vote. Um, and that matters, and it could matter more as it, if it uh, continues to change. College educated whites did vote a little more for Biden overall but it's, um, it's big. You can see how big the black percent is, the uh, Latino Latinx percent, uh, Asian American, uh, other meaning Native Americans, um, uh, Americans uh, from India, uh, several other places. Um, here the simple point is, and I'll come back to this, five uh, states changed, uh, switched from 2016 to 2020. And then alphabetically, they are Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And in all those states, um, the, uh, the people of color matter big time. Uh, bulk of the, you know, Milwaukee matters. Uh, uh, Detroit matters. Philadelphia matters. Pittsburgh matters. Um, in Arizona, um, the uh, Latinx vote matters, but there's still a black vote there too. Navajo Nation mattered down there. Um, and Georgia, they all mattered. They all mattered. It was uh, so very close. Those are precisely the five states in which the Republicans have generated most of their concerns about we're going we're gonna to recheck the vote. That's the states they're aimed at, precisely those states that lost, and they can win them if they can scare enough whites and if they can suppress enough votes um, if from people of, of, of color. Okay, let's, that's where we are now, right now. Okay, let's now go to uh, the next slide. Uh, here I'm gonna say, talk about how the United States arrived at this 
a particular point. Um, and it's a, a, you know, a stylized history. Um, I'm going to go pretty fast over those. Um, there's not going to be, uh, uh, when I look at the difference between the first four, difference between uh, Western Europe, United States, the compromise of 87 down to World War One. I kind of have slides for those, uh, but I do have a couple of slides uh, that relate to um, the um, uh, New Deal, World War II, and and uh, post-1960. And so um, I'm going to show you those slides as, as an example of where we're going. Uh, so Pedro, if you would put that first uh, slide up. Now here, what I've done is taken the Gini coefficient and I ran it against the uh, non-agricultural union membership. It's, it's, it's a pretty good study. I actually had a retired uh, applied economist named uh, George uh, Blackford. Uh, I got to know a little bit the email and his interest as a retiree in Michigan. Um, I had him look at it for me. It's a, it's a, a if we do it, I think, uh, I forget, we did it a number of ways, but the, the correlation is, is minus 0.89 roughly. So it's, it's, and I recognize it's more than just power because there's, you know, technology changes and new industries arise and so on. But in fact, uh, what you can see is basic generalization. The unions do well uh, in times of real strife, especially uh, world wars, but they also benefited mightily from the New Deal. And so you can see how fast the um, unions rose in, in the, and we get back to this. But then notice the dip, the dip until 42. And, that, and the unions were actually on a defensive at this time. I think this is an excellent who wins indicator. We know workers want unions, most of them. Uh, we know the wealthy want to hold on to and increase their wealth. This is a class conflict diagram in, in a quantitative term, I do believe. Um, and you'll notice that 19, what rescued then the unions was the Korean War, because they did remobilize for the uh, Korean War. Um, and there you get your closest. And from there, it's been uh, the parting of the ways ever since, uh, with some accelerations. Um, here and there. Now, this uh, uh, diagram actually masks what's going on. So let me uh, go to the next slide. And this is, I take out the public sector, I separate public sector union membership from private sector union membership. And here I want to stress, and I might have switched here to uh, standard stuff. I was using Richard uh, Freeman stuff, uh, but his things run out at 95. So there's little, little small glitches um, that have to be smoothed out by really good econometricians, which I'm not. Um, but I want to stress here that we're just talking percentages here, not actual numbers. And so public sector unions grew very fast um, from, from uh, mid-60s on, but picking them up about 1970, uh, they're about 17% of uh, 18.3 or so million, excuse me, um, uh, union members. But by, by 1998-99, it's something like 48% of 16 million, give or take a few hundred thousand union members, in other words, declining number of union members, they're 48% they're of the union movement. And by 2009, they're 51.2% of the union movement. Uh, and then union movement was 51, uh, was of 15.3 million, I think it was. Now I'm risking, you know, not looking at my, uh, at my notes, but you can't, you can't understate the way in which the union movement was really in a serious decline. And it really, I think, takes a nosedive there in the uh, early 1970s. And, and, and uh, as time marches on here, I think I want to say at this point too, it's a good point to say, in what I'm going to say, I think that the timing of, of, of the serious right turn 
has, has, has not been correctly stated. I think the crunch time came, as I'm going to explain, in the late 60s and 70, 71. Um, and, and it's been downhill ever since. Um, I don't think that uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce had anything to do with it. I don't think that um, the idea that the corporate community suddenly realized it was under siege and decided to collectively organize had anything to do with it, which are um, the narratives I hear from, um, from other researchers via their, um, their writings. So now let's um, uh, go back to that. Maybe go back, Pedro, to the, maybe we'll go back to, yeah, let's go back to the list. The heck, let's go back to my list. Okay, let me talk about the difference between the United States and, and Western Europe that I think are really important, uh, more in, than the comparative kind of thing. First big difference is the American uh, uh, capitalists had no rivals. They did not grow up in a feudal society. That I think was, was very crucial. And we've got to remember that, you know, although the plantation capitalists were very different, they were putting together land and labor to sell a product on a market. And, you know, for them, it was a good part of European kind of market. And for all the differences the Northern capitalists and the plantation capitalists had, there was a lot of synergy um, in terms of, of their growth, including for New York Wall Street, and especially groups on Wall Street that were willing to work uh, with uh, the Southerners. So I think that matters. It also matters that uh, the separate colonies had very small government. They were really fairly lightly overseen by the, uh, the British government. And so uh, the economic elites, as we can call them out, or the segments of the capitalist class, they really did have um, a lot of stature and say so uh, compared to European countries that had uh, uh, strong states. Uh, the third thing I'd say is uh, the United States really never had a big military until uh, World War I, and then it was disbanded, and then we had a big one ever since uh, World War II. But what this meant was um, that basically the corporations hired their own armies, um, as we'll see as, as, as it unfolded. And finally, there was no big one church in the United States. Christendom mattered. Here I'm following a man, a uh, sociologist named Michael Mann. Um, and I, I do think it mattered. And I do think that church was powerful. And even a thing like the Papal Bull of 1892 or 1894, which said, hey, come on, you got to treat the workers right. In effect, maybe call it for union. Christian democratic parties are possible and so on. None of that, you see, is, I, I think can happen in the United States. So a very different power situation that uh, the capitalists have, have no rivals. They don't have state rivals. Uh, they, they don't have church rivals. They don't have uh, feudal uh, uh, rivals. Now, the way they created their, their constitution, they had an in, one inadvertent result. And I want to emphasize that Richard Hofstadter wrote on this called Making of a Party System. They didn't like parties, but they created the rules, the structure that makes for a two-party system. Uh, when you have winner-take-all in districts and in states, and you're zealous to have states, and you're gonna, everybody's going to have two senators, and when you add a presidency that's going to be the glue, you've created one giant winner-take-all district called the United States. And you can win that um, election, as you know, it's 45, 40. Nixon had like 30, 43, 44 um, percent, because when we, we all know about the Electoral College, so we, I, I, I don't want to get off onto that. But the point is they inadvertently created a powerful structure of a um, two-party system. And this, this was one of my, uh, here, a small group, I, I would express my frustration about the 70s uh, when we talked about these things. And I could never get my next door neighbor, Jim O'Connor, my next door neighbor in the in the office building, had the next office, 
structural Marxists. And I could never, I could say, how about the structure of the electoral system? But those structures always seem to not count. Um, it was very frustrating um, uh, kind of thing. And, and I thought I had, say, Jim convinced that they ought to be challenging in the Democratic Party primary. In 1980, he is the uh, nominal county leader of the uh, Citizens Party. So, so, so much for structure um, when, when it comes to uh, the state, which is a, a personal aside, I, I recognize, but let you know a little where I'm, I'm coming from on how serious it is uh, to take the structure of the state system uh, seriously as well. Well, I jumped from there and they created a constitution. It compromised uh, most of their differences or put them aside or tacitly accepted and so on. The point is that agreement came apart uh, over the next 70, you know, till, till the war, till the civil war horrible civil war in terms of blood and treasure and every kind of thing. But it did change the country in terms of aiding the growth, for instance, of more and more big companies. Um, uh, there starts to be the influx of all immigrants from uh, northern country uh, Europe and then eventually uh, eastern and southern Europe. So I, I want to jump then to uh, we know who won the war. We know there's an attempt at reconstruction. Why did reconstruction end? Why did there, why was there what I'll call a compromise of 1877? Meaning by that more broadly than what uh, C. Van Woodward uh, said, uh, but there was a, a compromise at both political and I think uh, uh, big business kinds of levels. The first reason that there was a compromise was um, the whites of the South were not going to acquiesce. They had a dominance culture. They had been slave masters and drivers. They had been vigilant. They were ready for violence at the drop of a hat. And they fought a terrorist war. And they just were wearing down. I think it would have taken for you know, many, many more troops, much more money. At the same time, uh, I think what and, and I, and at the same time, I think more and more it was big business that was running this uh, Republican Party. And here's, I think, the key point: they were starting to have their own labor problems. And the person that I think I've learned a lot from in the last just the last five six years has been uh, Heather Cox Richardson on the, you know basically talking about the South and the. Uh, Civil War, the end of Reconstruction, how the South won the Civil War. Um, I think they got worn down. Uh, and they were having their own labor problems, which, and this jumps ahead slightly, which is exemplified with what happened later in 1877, four or five months after the compromise. Yeah, there's the huge uh, outbreak of strikes, starting with the railroad strikes after big, big wage cuts. Uh, and a lot of property destruction and uh, troops moving all over the country and railroad cars, you know, f finding and fighting these these uprisings. So I think then the compromise of, of 1877 um, was one in which um, both sides of the uh, capitalist equation, if you will, um, decided they could uh, live and let live and let each other deal with their own uh, uh, labor uh, situation, which meant they said, okay, if you guys want to do whatever with the Southern uh, Blacks, and that meant a caste system. And I've decided to use caste, at least for the time being, because it means from birth to death, everything is proscribed, that you're subject to immediate violence, you have no rights. Um, and, and of course, you cannot intermarry, et cetera. You can't go to certain places. Um, and there was um, a, a lot of, of terror. Michael Schwartz wrote a book on this, a sociologist, um, fierce, combative, wonderful sociologist. Um, he wrote a book on the fact that what happened in the, in the fight with uh, over tenant farmers and so on is that it ended up that uh, black people were the tenant farmers and the 
whites in the South were the ones that went into the mills. So that it, it, it's kind of an interesting way to compromise the differences between the plantation capitalists and, and the business people um, uh, in the South. So we have, and at the same time, there's an expansion westward. And that is a conquering. And that involved creating caste. Caste for uh, Native Americans, caste for uh, Chinese immigrants, a lot of times for um, uh, Mexican Americans. And in some of these states, blacks were not allowed. California and Oregon originally said no, no black citizens. Um, the land was taken from these people step by step by step. And so you create another one of these real strong dominance kind of, of cultures. I think all this consolidated in uh, the years, uh, I put broadly 1895 to 1914, but I, I really think it was 1895 to 05. There's a lot of reasons for the uh, merger movement, a lot, of me, uh, uh, a lot of reasons for the incorporation of, of, uh, of industries, industries. They had not always been incorporated. And I think William Roy, a sociologist at UCLA, wrote a great book on the socialization of capital and explains all these things, involves class conflict and involves the populace. And by 1900, 1902, you had a pretty solidified uh, corporate community. And at that point you have a corporate rich because you have corporations, you have big managers, and you have them talking to experts and creating the first policy group. So I think right there was a consolidation. But at the same time as there was a consolidation uh, in the North, it was a corporate community that could defeat the working class. There was also a consolidation of a caste system in the South, um, the Great Plains, and uh, Rocky Mountain states. And I think that creates, the, that's the context I think we still mostly uh, live in today. Now, there is a brief period of uh, what was called the era of good feelings and some things where um, business, uh, the biggest businesses uh, actually talked to, had conversations with um, uh, some AFL leaders about uh, could they in any way be collaborative. And there were, and the uh, uh, unions were even helping encourage businesses to be a little more organized. What was that about? I, I'm, I'm rushing now. See, it's uh, turned it to five o'clock your time. Um, and that is that um, basically it was a deal with the skilled workers. It was a deal with the uh, people from the British Isles and Northern Europe, a tremendous number of whom were German Americans. Uh, German Americans is the biggest ethnic. If you ask people in, in 1990, they asked, who, what, what, if you had to say, what, what are you? In that sense, they said, German American was far, far bigger, three or four times bigger than Irish American, Italian American. So, but they were all integrated into the whole system in most places um, because they had school. But that, so that Germanic, um, British kind of thing were skilled workers and um, industrial union force. Wendy Mink wrote, Wendelin Mink, um, who came to Smith, left Santa Cruz, I think it was Smith, which is near you. And uh, she wrote a book called Old Labor, New Immigrants. Beautiful book on how the AFL um, uh, looked at the world and keep out the immigrants, keep, our, keep the labor market tight. Um, they were certainly discriminatory towards African-Americans. Phil Fawner told us that, not Eric, but Phil, the old um, the CP historian. Uh, I think he's right. I think uh, Paul Freimer, political science at uh, Princeton has shown, has shown that quite fully as well. So there was a caste system. 
uh, in America by that point, and it involved not just those countries I've said, but in fact, the white, uh, more elite working class, if you will, or skilled working class, uh, certainly um, it cast out African Americans into a caste system. And it was a long time before a gradual simulation of the Southern and Eastern Europeans. Well, in that context, of course, there were union gains in World War I because of tight labor markets. But also, I think Howard Kimmeldorf, a uh, sociologist at Michigan, has given us a great concept in 2013 called replacement costs. How, how costly is it for a corporation to absorb strike in terms of can it replace its workers? And there are some workers that are very hard to replace. And they are basically skilled workers, such as typesetters in that time, or um, uh, construction workers, machinists. But there's also workers that are hard to play, replace and, and to mess with because there's time constraints, railroads delivering milk or vegetables, products that arrive at docks. Um, they also have possibilities. And then finally, let me say the third one and go on. And also very isolated workers who the famous example was coal miners and then uh, Howard uh, did a great job, Kimmeldorf did a great job of showing that for uh, rural Pennsylvania and West Virginia. You don't walk into those coal mines in West Virginia from New York City and just think you're going to not be run out of town. So um, the unions that then made it uh, were very unique in terms of, of replacement costs. And, and where that relates to World War I is they needed uniforms. They needed garment workers. And the garment workers had decided they should quit fight among each other. And they got Sidney Hillman to be their leader. Hillman had his connections in the government. And uh, the uh, amalgamated clothing workers were one strong union that came out of that war, although they got then uh, really um, beaten to death in the in uh, the twenties, as you know. But the point is, here um, and rushing and telescoping, you got the United Mine Workers and the uh, Amalgamated Clothing Workers are the two key unions that um, that go towards um, creating the uh, the CIO. Well, the Great Depression, the New Deal. Um, obviously, you've seen the slide how it goes up. But I want to stress to you a couple key things about it. And here I'm really just trying to move even faster. And that is, first, you got to understand the important role of, of uh, the uh, deal that essentially uh, Senator Wagner had made already during the NRA uh, with the Southerners. And that is, we're not going to mess with your uh, labor force. Uh, the Democrats by then, for ethnic reasons, machine Democrat reasons, uh, were pretty close to uh, the AFL. Um, and Wagner was able, and, and people worked with him, were basically able to um, carry the Section 7A through the NRA all the way into the National Labor Relations Act. Now, I want to say a couple of quick things about the National Labor Relations Act in, in the context of the policy planning network. Large businesses had been trying to figure out how to deal with unions. The most conservative ones were just smashing. Them. The others were kept trying to work out company unions, we call. And, and they were trying to get a, a, a deal. Basically, again, this is important with the skilled kind of workers. So when the NRA passed, it had Section 7A. I think Fran Piven's right. It created an explosion of organizing. Uh, it wasn't fully successful. Uh, didn't go, wasn't a straight line, but it was important. It stirred things up. And the business advisory group within the NRA said, called the labor advisory group and said, hey, let's, let's see if we can put together maybe a little labor board. It was kind of like during World War one. And that was the origin of the National Labor Board, which was the first board. General Motor, General Electric guy, and the Standard Oil guy, and some others were on it. Now, so they actually were part of a collaboration there. It looked like it was going to be state building. It didn't happen. 
And the businessmen ended up totally opposed. They did not like what happened. In one sense, you can say it got away from them. What happened? The deal, the fight was over a question of call, uh, what I'll, I'll call winner take all versus what the word was used, proportional representation. The big business said, we'll deal with these unions separately. That's what they wanted to do, which means they could deal with the skilled workers, give them a good deal, and say no to the industrial workers. Basically, um, Hillman and, and Lewis, and I'm telescoping, uh, they wouldn't go along with that. And there was enough power now generated by the unity of the working class, by the militancy, um, uh, there were enough liberal Democrats, a liberal labor coalition had forged, and they were able to pass the National Labor Relations Act. They were a very important part of creating that. They meaning, yes, a militant working class, yes, uh, liberals, yes, the people that had been elected as Democrats in the North. But you have to understand that it happened at the sufferance of the Southern Democrats because their labor force was left out. Otherwise, they would have filibustered it forever as they had successfully, could successfully do. Okay, so at that point, big business turned unalterably against uh, unions. They did everything from that point on, and we have the records. We have their newsletters from that time. Um, so uh, I've read through them. They're, they're, they're available in New York City. Um, they're available a couple of places. So you can just see what was happening week by week. They turned against it. They fought it every which way they could. And they never stopped. And then they financed uh, uh, constitutional challenges to it. South laid back until the unions came south. They came integrated. And by 37, 38, the South was forever against unions. So you had a reunited uh, two segments of the uh, capitalist class fighting the unions. They still might not have won. In, in fact, they, it, it, but what happened was 38. Now, here's where I think fate and, and, and dumb things come in and what we don't know. Roosevelt made a mistake. He balanced the budget. At the same time, the Federal Reserve Board made some mistakes. They thought they had too much excess reserves. The result was a drying up of money, balancing the budget. And created the second biggest depression, the, the Great Recession, the Roosevelt, um, the Fed uh, recession. And the Republicans won. And here we have to know about voting and Larry Bartels and Aiken in their book on, on voting. And people vote their short run. What's it looked like lately? And Northern Republicans returned to office in 38. And there was enough strength to create what's now formally called, was called the Conservative Voting Coalition. Conservative Voting Co Coalition ruled America from 1939 to 1994 on anything that had to do with the workforce. They ruled on every union issue. They never lost in the legislature again. Uh, they also ruled on civil rights. And um, they, they ruled on a number of other things too. But, but the Democrat, the Southern Democrats would side with the Northern Democrats when it came to spending. So Congress was basically a conservative voting coalition on class issues, and it was a spending coalition, which was subsidies for the Southern Democrats and, and the agriculture and subsidies for the, the Northern machine Democrats, the ethnic uh, Americans in um, um, in the growth coalitions, the in the real estate land business in the north, and that was the two parties. Um, and and uh, the whole point of the Democratic Party was to exclude um, uh, African Americans. World War II changed a lot because a lot more African Americans came north. A lot more African Americans. Uh, gained the feeling we have a right and were then activists after World War II. It was also the case, I think, that um, World War II brought a business into government. Uh, it, made, it made the corporate community a 
uh, military industrial complex. It, it's not a separate one. It is one and the same. It's all the same big businesses. And um, after that war, what happened? Down went the, uh, the union density percent. Korean War, you saw on that slide, helped save the day. Uh, and then it's downward. But tra 60s transformed the power structure to a considerable extent. And I want to look at this quickly from labor point of view. And I know I'm leaving some of the war out, but it goes like this. Um, the, the civil rights movement dynamited the power structure because it ripped open the Democratic Party. Uh, using strategic nonviolence, they were able to disrupt normal uh, political and economic reproduction of the system. They had the help of, of, of Northern white new leftists, which is where they came into uh, the occasion, into the equation. By 1960, 60, 64, 65, just a whole lot of white Americans had, had enough. They said, it's gone too fast, it's gone too far. That registered in the North through the primaries and the vote for George Wallace should be taken seriously. But 64 election, nonetheless, Woody Frimer, I mean, uh, Paul Frimer has pulled out of his uh, work on uh, black and blue on African Americans and the, and the unions. 84% of the white union has voted for LBJ uh, that year. Um, 1968, 40% of them. 1972, 36%. That split within the union movement, they chose their skin color and resisting integration of neighborhoods, schools, jobs, blacks are mostly an unskilled job, and their unions, they chose their white identity. Did they know they were shooting themselves in the foot as far as their union? I don't know for sure. I kind of think they must have known to some extent uh, for reasons I'm now going to uh, explain. But that change that created a first opening in the Democratic Party toward it becoming, and it was by no means uh, an inclusionary party at that point. Uh, but the in the South, you got to remember Goldwater won the five deep South states from South Carolina on over through um, Mississippi and Louisiana. So that was their new stronghold. And that was the beginning of this real change um, that happened. The other thing that you got to understand, I think, about the 60s is that the, there was real labor conflict and real annoyance on the part of the corporate treaty. Now, they've been fighting unions ever since. There was never an accord, never a treaty of Detroit. They fought them every inch of the way, every minute of the day. James Gross has shown that to my total satisfaction in his trilogy, his great underappreciated um, um, trilogy on, on American class struggle. He doesn't talk that kind of language, but he's looking at it from the point of view of the National Labor Relations Board. Because what happened was Nick, Kennedy got two appointments to the to Labor Board. He put two Democrats on there, pretty liberal, one very liberal, very decent guy, Paul Douglas, who no, was it Douglas or Douglas's assistant? But at any rate, very strong, um, egalitarian oriented people. And there was already a Democrat on there. And they made a ruling on outsourcing that really upset the corporate community. It made a couple other rulings too. And at that point, the people that were more moderate corporate people began to organize to, to deal with the uh, National Labor Relations Board, and they started a labor law reform group, which later became very important as part of the business roundtable. But already at that point, they were organizing um, against uh, labor um, and, and fighting them hard. Then the point then became that in the late 60s, the corporations have their own reason why they are in a fix. They created this fix in part for themselves, as I said earlier, because now these big corporations from Western Europe and Japan were competing with them on steel and on autos in particular. 
But at the same time, it's boom time because of the war, because of the prosperity of the economy, tight labor markets, and there's inflation. But Johnson does makes a decision not to do, you know, to get put controls on the economy like in the Korean War and World War II, and you get runaway inflation when the corporations are trying to con- complete more factories. They want to compete. Now, they ask for this competition, but they got to now deal with it. They are really upset, and their views become much more hardline on a number of issues. And in the in August of 69, they created uh, the Construction Users Anti-Inflation Roundtable and starts the story of, um, of uh, trying to destroy the construction workers unions by creating alternative uh, training programs, by organizing city by city, by working closely with the construction union. And I think they were starting to be successful at, um, I think Jill Cordagno, a great sociologist, Florida State, has done some fine work on this. So they really had the unions uh, backpedaling uh, by um, 73, 74 in construction. Um, the uh, Construction Users Anti-Inflation Roundtable became the business roundtable. That became the center of, uh, of, of corporate power from uh, that point on. And we have a lot of their papers uh, as well. Now I wanna jump, so I'm saying that's the turning point uh, from 64 to about 74, 68 elections, that's a killer. Nixon puts all, starts to put these uh, right-wingers on the court and on the National Labor Relations Board. And it's just small things here and there. And then pretty soon the goon kind of union busting firms are back in the 70s. So I think the uh, Carter years are a mop up. They're a total defeat for the uh, for uh, uh, unions. And um, I, I'm sorry to say this this way and briefly, but I think Reagan years were a mop up uh, in many kinds of a way. And yet it, it gets lionized. Oh, from 1980 to 2020. I'm argued to you, no, the 60s race, complex situation for the uh, big business, euro dollars, all of that are more important. I want to jump and, and basically come close to quitting with, re, with something that we I haven't appreciated till the last five years. I don't think we give enough credit. We don't give black community enough community credit, won't give John Lewis enough credit. Redistricting and transformation of the major parties, 1990, 1996. Basically, the Republicans came to, uh, it was Southern Republicans, but Bush knew they were doing it. And he, the first Bush, and they came to the Southern Democrats and said, Southern Black Democrats, would you consider maybe uh, a deal over redistricting? What was the deal in the most brief terms. It was, look, we will create a lot more seats for black Democrats if you let us create seats, use strategies that will get us more seats. And the common goal is to get rid of Southern white Democrats. And that worked. And I'll come back to why the Southerners took it, Southern blacks took it. But in any case, in 92, 94, um, basically, the uh, Southern uh, uh, Blacks went, they'd had three seats. Here's why. They, they knew they were in a political cast. They had three seats between 1965 and, and, and 1989 in uh, the traditional 11 or 12 Deep South states. Three one in Atlanta, which is John Lewis was in, one in Memphis, the middle class funeral guy, with, director guy was in, and, and a big rural district in Mississippi. In 1990, they won the seat in New Orleans. So they knew they, it wasn't going to happen for them. So at any rate, in that time period, the uh, Republicans, the, the, the Democrat, Southern Democrat, Southern Black Democrats gained uh, from three, four to 17 seats. There are now 17 seats in the House. But the, the, uh, the Republicans got a lot more. 
I mean, they went uh, to have about 26 more, 1994, and five Democratic House members said, oh, I'm a Republican. And the uh, Shelby, the senator, Democrat senator from Alabama, said, oh, I'm a Republican now. So you had a big switch. And then in 96, even more, uh, four or five more seats they won. That's the near southernization of the Republican Party. But it really was finished off in Texas. There's some good work by a political scientist on this showing that the Democrats had, had 17 seats to 15 for the uh, Republicans um, in uh, about 2002, 2006, 22 Republicans, 11 uh, Black, 11, 11 Democrats. But now two or three of them are, are, they created some Black districts. So overall, right now, we have about 51 Black members of the House who are Democrats and one Black uh, senator. But in any case, what this did was to southernize the, the Republican Party. The Democratic Party was now possibly a um, inclusionary party or a you know, multi-ethnic party, but it didn't really become so. It was only very gradually. And I think John Lewis's deal, and this need, needs to be researched more, I, one of my goals would be to somehow see his papers and his strategy. He said, we're for this. We, he said, I can envision multiracial uh, coalitions led by you know, people of different colors. And so I think they were trying to become big enough to work with their Northern allies, uh, but the Northern allies weren't getting any bigger. Now we're 2018. Uh, many people are scared by uh, Trump, and you get the 2018 election result. It's that point that I think the Democrats became an inclusionary party. But the point is, they had been uh, the way had been prepared by these uh, the events I've I've talked about, uh, with the final step being the, the redistricting. Um, uh, Pedro, could we go to the next slide? Uh, no, the, yeah. So here. Republicans, I think we have white uh, uh, dominance right now. I think uh, there's also clearly an effort to make it, it's going to be white male dominance. I mean, that's an all out the dominance. Uh, but Republicans have these strong weapons of gerrymandering, voter suppression, possibly this legislative control of elections. Um, they have the filibuster, which Gentleson in a new book called The Kill Switch, just a year too old. He worked for uh, former uh, speaker, uh, head of the speaker of the House, speaker of the Senate for uh, for um, Harry Harry from Nevada. Uh, Gentleson calls it the kill switch. It's killed everything. Uh, and and thirdly, you have an ultra conservative majority on the Supreme Court. And who knows what they're going to do on which of these things? So then the map below it shows you America. The Republican Party has a stronghold in eleven of. 14 of 17 former slave states. That means the only ones that aren't part of it are Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. Although the southern part of Delaware sure is. Um, there's nine Rocky Mountain Great Plains states. Indiana has a history that makes it mostly towards the south, as does uh, southern Ohio, incidentally. But in any case, uh, we also have a situation of where the uh, Republicans control the state legislatures in the swing states of Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, but they do not control the governorships in um, Michigan, um, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So on gerrymandering, that could be um, a, you know, quite who knows. This it's, it's, it's all who knows kind of territory at that point. But that's, that's the reality. I think that's the reality of of America in that map. Okay, next slide. Um, so the issues are, will Congress pass the voting rights? Will, will, will voter su suppression uh, uh, succeed? To me, that's, that is the existential issue. I think it's the, the biggest issue. Um, um, I hope the Democrats, uh, I'm showing bias here politically, but I hope they have a plan. I, I'm not, not sure anymore that they do or that they can get much out of the Congress. And then, of course, there's the infrastructure build back better bills. 
they could be important because I think these, I think the deaths of despair kind of idea is important. I think these white males that were union people that are not college educated, they are lost souls in Ohio, Kentucky, uh, rest of, a lot of the Midwest. They can't, they don't feel that they're established and yet they're white. Why is this happening to me? Can they get good enough jobs that they can feel good enough to vote class instead of a white identity? Will the Democrat voters turn out in as large or larger numbers than they did in 2020? We don't know that. And more specifically, I think uh, there's the following things. Will the white voters in the face of, of any kind of disruption and constant fear threats and so on, will some of the more of these white voters turn to the Republican party? Um, you got to have 43, 44% of them, my guess, to, 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 to win. I think they could skitter, <laughs> you know, getting, getting into cattle. I think they could skitter and run. They could stampede. Um, what'll happen with Latinx? Uh, you know, there's a lot of outmarries, a lot of lighter skinned uh, people of, of Latin background. Um, they're intermarrying like crazy. 65% in one study of, of American-born Latinx identify themselves as white. Uh, there's a lot of, of Eurasians. Um, I think right now Eurasians are so targeted that I think that they're likely to, to stay um, uh, Democrats, but who knows? Um, there's also the question of what are African-Americans who are 11, 12% of the uh, population who are double in size as far as the middle class, who have far greater access to uh, college and professional educations, who have many positions in corporations, in the media, in professions, um, been CEOs of big corporations. What are, what are people that are still treated as second class citizens going to do if they now lose their votes? Um, I don't know. I don't think they'll break along class lines. I think they'll break along caste line. I'll also say that another variable for me is what I call WWWW, you know, obviously mocking there. But what will the WWWs do? And I mean, what will white women do? They are under enormous provocations on abortion. Uh, however, most are not, many are not of reproductive age. They have access to fly to somewhere and to get an abortion, but they are being constantly uh, um, put in a position of where they, they can't go back to work. Uh, they don't have control of their bodies. They are very close to having, you know, some kind of breakthrough to power. What are they going to do in the face of, 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 a, of a male patriarchal white supremacy? Um, I, I frankly uh, don't know. Let me go to my final slide. Um, you know, it's a game of inches. It's a game of a few votes. And the Henry Wallace party was a disaster. It was carefully studied. It was a mistake, but that was forgotten by 1968. It didn't have any impact, but, uh, but nonetheless, it was a mistake. And, but that's okay. Barry Commoner did it again in 1980. And then in, and then in 2000, Ralph Nader, who was a great activist and consumer activist, uh, he decided, uh, one friend of mine, they asked, they said, Ralph, you got it, you got it endorsed Gore in uh, Florida. And my friend told me, he said, we got to teach the Democrats a lesson. Um, he taught them a lesson. If one third of the voters in New Hampshire that voted for the Greens had voted for Gore, he would have been president. If a half a percent of the 97, 98,000 Nader voters had voted for Gore in Florida, he would have uh, won uh, and won the presidency. Um, 
I've looked at this in terms of all the right and left voters in Florida, There's about 100,000 left voters, about 36, 37,000 right voters. So if everybody voted, you know, their, uh, their cautious vote, he would have won, Gore would have won. I do put up here 2016, you'd think everybody would learn because well, feminists, people of color, environmentalists, they were all so angry with Nader they couldn't see straight as Bush came into office. But in 2016, Hillary Clinton would have won Michigan if she had just 22% of the Green Party votes. Now they sure didn't vote for, um, for Biden. The percentages are very small. She would have won Wisconsin if she'd gotten 77%, which is a stretch, of course, obviously. But there were no Green Party on the ticket on the ballot in 2020 due to a technicality. And uh, the Democrats won um, that state. So they won Michigan and, and uh, Wisconsin. I just want to say to you that I think that, that, that it is indeterminate what's going to happen. Depends on what a lot of people do. Depends on whether whites in general skitter. Depends on whether white women vote um, more uh, their own equality and freedom. It depends on whether uh, highly educated people who have become morally angry um, decide to vote purity over Democrats. Just a whole lot of things. Um, I will close at that point. Um, I don't know whether I've been right, but I hope I've been uh, provocative. And I'm glad to entertain uh, questions, comments, and try to make clarifications for as long as you want to talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. <clears throat> so, Bill, you'd like prefer the questions and comments, people to type out their questions, and then I can read them out to you. OK. If you want, if anybody has, so if you want to, uh, you could write questions. Um, this is in setting my he hearing issue. I got hearing aids. And so a lot of this stuff doesn't um, come through well. If your mic's not just right, I lose higher pitches. I might be more likely to lose Caitlin's voice. Um, so I um, uh, appreciate it if, if, it, if it kind of, if I heard it from Larry, I can hear his deep voice. <laughs> okay, well, we have a request from uh, David Cotts to, so that he, as a, he can't type out his question, but he has a deep voice. So we're gonna violate this and I'll, David, ask your question and then I'll repeat it. If okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Bill, can you hear me okay? Sort of, that was pretty good so far. Okay, I'll shout louder. Uh, uh, you emphasized the uh, late 60s as the key period when the big change uh, right. that occurred uh, can be uh, explained. Uh, now, uh, uh, at the same time, the data show that the big change in trends on inequality and so forth began around 1980. Uh, uh, so uh, what do you think is at stake uh, in your argument? Uh, it clearly, there were roots of the changes in the late 60s, and additional things kept happening in the early 70s, the mid 70s, the late 70s. Uh, under Carter, Paul Volcker becomes head of the Fed. Uh, deregulation begins, then 1980, uh, uh, first bank deregulation bill. Many people think the key to the change was in the late 70s to early 80s. What do you think is at stake in your I, interpretation? Yeah. I, I do talk about that. I should say, I talk about that in my uh, 2020 book. I also wrote a book that uh, <clears throat> was uh, in terms of its format, a mistake, but I wrote a book in 2013 or 2014 called The Myth of Liberal Ascendancy, where I, I went into this stuff in depth because I had basically tracing the changes in the Committee for Economic Development and, and the Origin of the Business Roundtable. I think the key changes, I mean, it took them a while, but power wise, the 68 election was pivotal because it meant that the uh, labor board and the Supreme Court could be changed, but not just them. The Department of Labor was used to create a, a variety of 
of, of apprentice programs and to farm out apprentice programs to get, you know, to take things away from the unions. Um, all of that was going on at that at that particular time. Um, and the Davis-Bacon Act was suspended for a time, which prevailing wage in the construction people in an area. All of those undercuts started to show. And I do think that if we look at the actual numbers on the, um, the Gini coefficient, uh, if we look at the start of the labor decline, you do see these little drops start to happen, you know, key drops. In the 60s, a lot of times the wages held up because the unions, even though I said the unions started to decline, the key unions, which I left out, if I talk, the, the, the auto and steel and construction unions, machinists, they all could, they could still, they had the corporations by the throat in a lot of ways, still at that particular point. So Republicans taking over and switching these um, other other agencies, which I think was made possible by the huge shift in the middle American white vote, a lot of which was white unionists. That's why I used uh, Frimer's numbers. I think that mattered. And I do think those things all started down at that particular point. Um, I'd have to go look step by step at these numbers as they change. But in every step, they did lose on everything. Everything Nader tried really failed from 75 on. Carter, the Labor Law Reform Act, for instance, which was the last big gasp, it got 58% of the vote in the House. It got 59% of the vote in the Senate, but 41 senators said no. I mean, this is the kind of power and uh, there with powerful changes that were going on. And the other thing that happened in this, this uh, would I put forth for political economists, I think that um, the, the really huge thing happened uh, was the way in which the corporate community decided to deal with uh, inflation in the 70s. Now, as you know, inflation took off in part because of the heating up of the Vietnam War. The fact that the businesses really wanted to, they were double timing people. I mean, you know, really working people to get these factories built to compete with uh, the Germans and the Japanese. Um, so, the, the, but the then they got control of the inflation. What really caused the inflation was um, the shortage in raw materials, then OPEC, and shortage in agriculture, and we didn't have reserves because Nixon didn't foresee the future and he sold a lot off to, to the Soviets. So inflation shot up like crazy. Uh, Charles Schultz, Brookings Institution, um, mainstream um, uh, Keynesian of his day, he gave a talk to these big business guys. And he said, look, your problem is that there's a tremendous decline in uh, demand because these people aren't working because of the, essentially the money's going to, let's say Saudi Arabia, um, prices are going up on basic foods. Um, he named several of these things like, and oil prices are going, you know, you're paying for the gas and you, and with the inflation, you're in a higher income bracket. So he suggested a Keynesian way to deal with and actually spends, get some money in the consumer's hands, cut the uh, social security tax or, you know, stop it for a while. There were several liberal members of the corporate community that, uh, who were more fringy. And one was a real estate guy and a Democrat. And they argued for this more Keynesian solution. A, a liberal Keynesian con conclusion. The other, the business Keynesians, which was the, who had more monetary policy in their whole thing, they said, no, raise interest rates. I claim raising interest rates is a tremendously powerful power move because 
throws people out of work. In other words, my view is from reading that literature, and I say it best in the myth of liberal ascendancy book, I think in most detail, but here's the problem with it, the book. I, I was so annoyed with Hacker and Pearson and several others that uh, the book is also built around, you know, saying that I don't think their work is very good, and I still don't. Um, and various other people like that. So I was, and and Mark Mizrucci, uh, sociologist. I thought uh, so. I, I I was trying to still think I was part of an argument with them, but it it just got uh, pushed aside. Not to mention uh, the institutionalist, the, the theta, the Scotch pool, and so on. But that, of course, was Hacker and Pearson were her her students. So, the, but the book has a detailed statement of of uh, of uh, Charles Schultz's view, and 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 then Charles Schultz went on to say to economists who interviewed him later, you know, after he'd retired, he said, look. The only way you could get away with the Fed raising interest rates was to not put it on the, on, the, on the president. So when Volcker came in and said, I'm just tracking the money supply, he, uh, Schultz and a number of other economists said, baloney, that's not what you're really doing. That's your cover. And they said that. And, uh, and, and there, one of them was a, a Fed economist who I think, I, you know, I didn't review on names for this. So I think there is, the, I think the, I, I want to stick with the argument that um, it was this series of events um, that really um, uh, set the stage for the problem. And, and the other thing that was going on at this time, you know, we talk about all the transportation revolutions that, you know, led to the container ships and all. I think they're a little later too. The key thing was, that with the Eisenhower highways and the whole improvement of, 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 of uh, uh, trucking, in fact, they were outsourcing the whole time. They were moving to the south. They were always moving southward. So the unions were being undercut in that kind of way as well. That's why I think union density percent really tells you something. It tells you the right to work states are on this, you know, there's more of them. They're moving more to the South. Uh, they're defeating certain unions. And at the same time that um, uh, um, the top 1% is getting more, I think. I think if I use uh, says data on the half percent, I'd probably get this better. Um, so anyway, I, I, we do disagree, but it's a friendly disagreement. I think it's around uh, data. Um, Here's the other thing about that I think is wrong with. I'm wary about that from a power position, the, the position that's from the 80 onward. I'm wary of it because when when it's told by Hacker and Pearson and people like them, they it's essentially, oh well, Powell. I know. And then there's the Powell memo, which I think is totally off base. It was written by you know a right wing lawyer who yes became on the Supreme Court. He wrote it in seventy or seventy one to a buddy in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it had no impact on the Chamber of Commerce till seventy three or seventy four, according to historian uh, of business Ben Waterhouse, now at uh, uh, North Carolina. Um, so everybody then essentially has it. Oh. And, and the person that, um, uh, I forget her name, the historian at NYU who, who writes about the right wing. Uh, they give a lot more credit to the right wingers um, and the right wing think tanks. They, they came later and, and it creates this view that on the one hand, the businessmen just had to get themselves together. No, I think there were real things happening like, Republicans that made it possible for the businessmen. Otherwise, there'd been more of a, of, of a, of a stalemate. The second thing that happens, um, and this is a, a, a more touchy issue, I think that their analyses essentially underplay the role of, of white racism in the union movement 
and its destructive effect. In other words, the poor workers were defeated by a now aroused set of capitalists. I don't think those capitalists could have beaten them if they had stuck with their union and a Democrat vote, I think it would have been much more of a standoff. And, and so that's sort of an analysis that um, takes it a little further, but also gets into the arguments uh, of the day, uh, of the time. But now, and, you know, and, and get into more trouble with you, I'm sure, but but I think David Harvey gets these things mostly wrong in his short history of neoliberalism. And he has a statement where he talks about the Powell memo. And then sh shortly after, we don't know whether causal or not, the business roundtable was formed in 72. And, you know, I, I don't think that he has an accurate view of what happened based upon my reading of archives and my reading of people that I think have been in the archives, which are uh, James Gross for uh, unions and Kevin Boyle, a historian on union. I think they are better uh, on unions and what happened to them. And a man named Mark Linder, who was in the business roundtable paper and wrote a book in 99, not, you know, he's a lawyer, former lawyer for farm workers, and then at University of Iowa Law School. Iowa Law School. I didn't know his book till 2014. Well, he called, wrote a book called Wars of Attrition. And you can see how they're fighting these construction unions. They let him see their papers um, in the late 90s. And, um, and never again, and <laughs> he did. But he did, he was in their paper. Those are the people I'm trusting um, for uh, my analyses. And I am then critical of, of Hacker, Pearson, Scotch Pool on the one hand, and um, I must confess of, of um, at, at David Harvey and liberal, neoliberal ideas on the other. I think the neoliberal ideas is the ultra conservative ideas that were put forth you know, in the early 20th century and fought over um, then after World War II the corporate moderates after World War II, they enduring, they said, we can't go back to our standard economics. We can't go back to the NAM view of the world. We have got to create our own version of Keynesianism. There's a fine book on business Keynesian by a historian as well. So I think the post-World World War II world was fought between liberal Keynesians, many of whom were leftists, um, Bertrand Gross, I mean, I go on and on um, about uh, those people. And on the other hand, there were a set of business Keynesians, and they were uh, people I called moderate conservatives, uh, which was a word that people didn't like. But, um, but I think the moderate conservatives turned more conservative. And at the same time, the National Association of Manufacturer kind of guys became less isolationist. So they, they recongealed. Anyway, I appreciate your question. And we do dis, we do disagree. I think, uh, as they say, I think, I think we, we, we'd have to go to a lot more sources. I hope people do more with this. They do a better job with the time series that I think are now available. As, as much as Piketty et al. have done, I think more could be done with it. Any other questions? Yeah, we have some uh, ready to go. So from Kevin Young, um, here's his question. What do you think is the potential for greater, uh, is the potential for greater fractional, fractionalization within the US corporate elite? And what do you think it w will slash could be? I know you disagree with Ms. Ru uh, Ms. Rucci, but uh, that's the question. Greater fractionalization in the in the uh, uh, corporate elite is it going to happen? What's it going to be about? Um, I I don't know for sure because I, I, the way I put it is that we're not able to barge into their houses. We're not able to ask them for their papers. We're not able to know uh, their strategies. We don't know which which quite which business journalists or which Washington Post journalists and so on have the best line into them. So, 
So in that sense, I'm, I'm reading from a distance. And, and uh, I'm not sure. They, I think they're going to, my best guess is they're going to play a game where uh, they try to uh, smooth. On the one hand, they, they're still pretty short run on, on their profits. Um, they got a real problem dealing with their whole fossil fuel part of it, which is a huge part of it. Um, I think they know the plant, they're going to fry the planet and flood it. Uh, if they keep this up, I think they know it. Um, but, um, and I don't think they're that afraid of the Republicans. Um, I think they'd have to come to terms with the idea that, that they could do well within a, a modern welfare state. I don't see them headed in, the, headed in that direction uh, right now. But I think the issues that concern them are the ones that are right before the country right now. Um, it doesn't have to do with anything that it, it, uh, Mark Mizrucci said, incidentally, although I disagree strongly with Mark Mizrucci on that particular book, he did write a fine book on um, the development of the corporate community effect from 1900 to 1982. I, I wrote a, uh, a forward for it because he asked me to. Uh, we are colleagues who came to um, disagreement over this he put he his background is much more marxist finance capital and uh he wanted to put everything on the banks and when the banks uh, i happen to think that sweezy was more right that it was more corporate capital at that point and i've read all those debates and and uh um so i i just i think he's 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 wrong on those things but he did some fine fine work in the past, but I don't think his issues are what are on the table now is the way I would put it. I, when I try to think of what Mark had to say, they, they aren't the ones that are, that are now before us. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Great. So now from Michael Ash, I have a series of questions. Uh, incidentally, he says, uh, <laughs> he, he met you when uh, your son was coaching his nephew in Santa Cruz in a basketball game. <laughs> his, his son was coaching? Your son was coaching his nephew in a basketball game in Santa Cruz. Is oh, what yeah. He believes. And this is Michael who? Michael Ash. Michael Ash. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> well, <laughs> bad head. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead. <laughs> here his question is, are Republicans uh, potentially so far so far off the deep end that they can no longer keep the corporate rich in their corner, or or are endless tax cuts good enough? <laughs> I don't think endless tax cuts, yeah, are good enough. But you know, there are a lot of those social socialite types that I talk about can give millions and millions of dollars to uh, right-wing things. When you do the network analysis of, I mean, Heritage Foundation, all those, they're way on the fringe of those networks. Um, you know, look at their actual boards. You don't see anybody that's, a, 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 you know, from a corp Fortune 500 firm and so on. So they're, they're really very, very, I think, fringy. Um, the, um, the Federalist Society, thinks that the American Bar Association, which is you know, very much corporate dominated, is corporate lawyer dominated. They think they're, they are you know, liberals. So I, I think they, are, they, ha they have money, but I don't think they're you know, part of this uh, corporate community. I, I would want to know what the business roundtable uh, and, and organizations around it are going to do on these various issues. And now they've played a double, there's a very good new um, newsletter by a guy named Judd, J-U-D-D Legum, called Popular Information. And he's he's probably in his early forties. I've just learned of him. He's a, uh, uh, a, a good journalist, uh, a strong background in, in bringing in terms of, I think, liberal lawyers and so on. And he's, he's really carefully watching so they'll say oh we're against this but they're still giving money to those 
these, these corporations are still giving money to, you know, climate deniers or anti, you know, anti voter suppression guys and so on. But at the same time, they're saying, look, in general, we know we got to have a carbon tax. They put out crummy plans. They raised doubt. They caused delay. And then they put out an alternative that, you know, maybe is sort of plausible, but it's not enough. I, I just don't know what they're going to do. But, but most of all, I don't think anybody does. And, and, uh, and that, for me, is the frustration with the people who are sure that, that they think they know what is, is um, going to happen. But I, 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 uh, I don't know. I once read, I read, read some essays from Trotsky, and I'll never forget this one thing. He said, if the ruling class and the bourgeoisie are together, it's fascism. If the ruling class and the working class are together, it's a social welfare state. And I think the, the corporate rich sit in the center. Um, I think uh, there's, there's complexity in their views. Uh, there are uh, people in their uh, center in their community that are black, that are from religions they're not from. Um, and I think they, they have a debate and what these people are going to do. Um, I, I just don't know. Uh, maybe other people do, I, but I, 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 I can't quite answer that question confidently. Okay. I'm, tell me when you're getting tired. I know we've been going for a couple hours. So, Well, the thing is that once I get rolling, uh, <laughs> I'm unstoppable. <laughs> okay. Everybody's going to have to disappear. No, I'm, I'm, I'm frankly glad to have a chance for um, this kind of intellectual interchange. I, I, uh, now not even teaching, and then two years of pandemic, isolation um, and strictly, you know, doing things through books. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's just, it's comfortable for me. And so I think it's okay. entirely well, whether well, anybody has any we'll, questions. And, we'll, we'll keep you know, going a bit longer. It. I mean, I'm glad to hear the counter arguments. Okay. So I'm, uh, Michael has a bunch of more questions. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to skip down and we can come back to them. So Pedro has a question. Um, how, in your view, are opinion shaping networks transformed by the rise of large online digital platforms, for example, Facebook? Um, and also, how does big tech relate to the policy plan networks? For instance, we see an increase in scrutiny and rising concerns over anti-competitive behavior from these digital conglomerates. So those are the questions. Yeah. So that's several things for me in terms of, I think, first of all, lots of the organizations of the policy planning network, of the opinion shaping network have definitely gotten on uh, Facebook and all those kinds of social media. If you, uh, uh, the one I think of that's sort of a, a generic of this is the ad council and they're, they're all over it. Um, lots of other organizations. We often don't know. There's the committee for X and Y. We don't know who it is at first. Um, then it turns out to be, you know, whether a right wing group or a moderate group or whatever. I have no doubt that they are using Facebook. But what I would say about that is that I, I think basically what's happened is the moderate Republicans used to be able to control those right wing Republicans. It, the right-wing Republicans were saying these incredible things uh, long, long, decades and decades and decades ago. Um, they had conspiracy theories. Eisenhower was a communist, you know, on and on. So, but the worms turned. They're much more powerful, and they're much more powerful because the white Southerners are now such a key part of it. The white Southerners had their reasons to have a certain distance from the Northern Republican and, and big corporations. And it involved their need for subsidies. They have a tremendous need for subsidies in their agriculture. And uh, they were uh, wanted to maintain their own distance. Now they don't. Uh, and so that reinforces, it brings in that whole, um, uh, 
culture of resentment that we're really the best and we're going to get back there no matter what. The other thing about this, there's a book by Larry Rosenthal called The Empire of Resentment. And I think it's, it's interesting because he shows that all of these different resentful whites, like in Wisconsin, which was carefully studied by a political scientist, they're, they're more rural and they're, they're not fully aimed at African Americans, they some of them in some counties had even voted for Obama, both in 2008 and then a few less in 2012, despite Walker taking over as the governor and the Tea Party being big in Wisconsin. They had enormous resentment, though, towards white elites in the city. And the white woman who was political scientist at Wisconsin, she went out and talked to him. And she's a native of the state, but boy, did they give it to her. I mean, she just got a lot of abuse sitting there you know, hearing it. But those kinds of people have now amalgamated, essentially. They found enough common ground. The right-wing Catholics, and I emphasize right-wing, they have been able to make an alliance with the evangelical Protestants who used to think they were the popery. That all happened in the 70s as they started to intermarry. And so you have then this coming together of Right and 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 you have very strong um, pro-Israel, very conservative Jews that are part of this, because the evangelicals now say we've got to unite Israel and make it powerful. Now their reason is that that will supposedly bring um, Christ back, but point is all of these right wings of these religions that used to fiercely dislike and distrust each other you know, they're all okay, partly through the abortion issue uh, for the Catholics and the evangelical. I'm saying that a lot of white resentment cultures have now amalgamated, including the white working class unions of the Middle West. And they are now more powerful in that Republican Party than they were in the past. And that does put, I think, the corporations on the <clears throat> defensive. And, and then so to the question, then, I think I'd also come back to say, yeah, I don't think at a certain point tax cuts will be enough for them because they do want immigrants. They do want uh, a resumption of normal trade. Um, they're not going to grow in a chaotic economy. And look, I don't, I'm not sure that there won't be major disruption if uh, African-Americans are harshly excluded once again. That is a very large community. It's in many places strategically uh, placed. Uh, but the black, the low income blacks are worse off than ever. I mean, there could be extreme poverty on the bottom and the cutting of of you know extended unemployment and all to supposedly get back people back to work in all republican dominated states which means all southern states you know plus some other states that, that have some low income populations of color um i don't know i i think there's a tough mix there in terms of of things could happen i, I think it's very volatile open kind of situation we don't even know what are what are these white supremacists going to do if they lose these elections? What if white women uh, vote more for Democrats? What if all Asian Americans vote more and vote more for Democrats? Uh, you know, I don't know what these white men are going to do. Um, we saw what they're capable of at the Capitol. And many of you may have looked at the, just this um, Sunday, the New York Times had a, they put together the whole thing, you know, you know, in the right cron order from many angles. And they were definitely out to um, capture, rough up, and maybe kill um, some of those Democrats, I think. Um, I think the evidence keeps pointing that way, but it it's there. And I, you know, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to know what they'll do in that situation if they don't have steady, regular jobs that make it possible 
for them to feel they can raise a family and be respected. Um, I think it's very much up in the air. I, I admit to a you know a social site dimension to all my thinking, and um, they become very authoritarian, very hard to talk to. The whole mask thing, not wearing masks, and and the vaccinations is simply incredible, right? So they politicize everything. Any other questions or yeah, comments? So I mean, comments are welcome, but where it's wrong. I will, I, I will have one more question we have from Xi Yen, and then I think we'll end the session just because uh, people have to yeah. move on. And you guys, 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 guys got to go to dinner. Where is it? <laughs> Three o'clock my time. I'm just getting started. <laughs> well, we, we could talk more later. So this one's from Xi Yen, and he says, how do you conceptualize the role of actors and organizations in the legal system, judges, law firms, et cetera, and the courts um, in your framework? Where do they fit in? Wow. I think they're tremendously important. I think, I think that there's still some, I think a lot of the, all of the challenges so far to the um, voting stuff have shown, I think, a lot of integrity within the court system. There have been even some, uh, I think, objective votes by, by um, Trump appointees. Um, I, I think in the end, it does come down to the Supreme Court. And I did look at it. And I've spent more pages on it in the new Who Rules than I have in the past and just read a whole lot of things. Um, and and I, I, I think they are out to, by saying states' rights, they're, they're giving, the, they're saying only Congress can uh, fix uh, deal with this voter suppression only Congress, and uh, but they also know that there's a, a kill switch in Congress. So they've been really bad on that. You know, they couldn't have been worse in the last few years on unions, as you, as you probably know. They uh, the uh, one of the, they they've essentially ruled that uh, uh, right to work laws apply to public unions. They've tried to undercut the public unions because you don't have to pay dues if you don't want to, uh, even though you're represented in your, your shop, so to speak, by a union. The other thing they did that was kind of amazing, a law that had been on the books in California um, that you uh, since, I think, 1972, that organizers could uh, talk to workers on corporate property during lunch hour and maybe it breaks. There were certain set time. The court ruled in the last year or so that was a taking in the same, you know, the powerful way of taking somebody's land. So that makes union organizers trespassers in, in any corporate property. I mean, they have made some fierce decisions on both voting rights and on uh, union rights in the last um, few years. Here's another way I'd put it as a generalization. The, the paradox of, of the years since the uh, civil rights movement have been, in a way, there's been more and more individual freedom for people that were previously excluded. Um, that means African-Americans have, have a larger middle class. They become more likely to become professionals. Um, it's also true for women and white women have probably benefited more from all of the changes than anybody else, and especially upper middle class white women and on up. Um, but it's also been a tremendous amount of freedom for um, uh, people of different sexual orientations, transgender people and so on. So there's all of this individual possibility, but the at the same time, there's been increasing uh, victory for owners over workers, that organizationally, uh, the capitalist class has become more powerful. I think they have won um, for the foreseeable future. On the other hand, what I tried to show with those slides, I think the unions have been decimated. There's only a few left 
they're usually in areas uh, that involve enormous expertise where they have some strategic capability to de delay or disrupt like UPS. The UPS drivers are still organized, um, but UPS depends on fast turnaround time. You know, so it is just these pockets of, of unions um, that, that are left. And, and half of them are in the public sector, which has its limits and now been limited more. And, and so when I try to look at it, 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 it we were going to try to get better welfare state out of union. Unions were going to force this through their role in the Democratic Party. It may be now that there's no longer a Southern white albatross in the party that really effectively ruled it. Uh, on all key issues. And the only two um, presidents that happened that were Democrats after 1968, of course, were Southerners, Carter and, and Clinton. Um, and the only one that might have come close to winning was Gore. So all Southerners. So I think now it's more likely happened in a, in a, in a party-based way. In other words, you have two parties. One of them is clearly inclusionary. Uh, it cl clearly wants a welfare state. If it was able to pass the build back better, plus the infrastructure as they wanted it, it would be transformational of the uh, of the society. So, um, so that the unions in that sense become a much smaller player than we had um, uh, thought when I was starting out in the 60s. The other thing that's happened that's big is how long segregation has happened, has gone on and wives, you know, switched at least for now to the word caste because the thought was, look, people are going to stick together in their union. And secondly, there's going to be more and more understanding, liberal individualism, social contact, which is what the social psychologists talk about. It hasn't happened. Uh, neighborhoods are just as segregated. Schools are just segregated um, as far as blacks. White immigrants, immigrants from Asia, immigrants from Latinx are, are integrating into this society as fast as the Southern and Eastern European immigrants did. And that's work by sociologists that are really good. Um, and they did it for the uh, one of the science organiz big science organizations, uh, the National Academy of Sciences. I think they did a report. Mary Waters is her name at Harvard. She and others. So you've got this paradox of where um, immigrants crawl in on, and and go higher faster than African Americans. So that's a continuation of the past, but now we're in um, this situation of um, the courts have made it impossible on unions because uh, they played a huge role in that. And they are now also maybe making it impossible to win via vote. And, and, and so I think that the, the courts are huge in this, but I stress, I only think for now the evidence is we're talking about the Supreme Court, and it's clearly six to three. Okay, um, thank you so much, Bill. That was oh, terrific. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. It was fun. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Great, and we'll we'll. Uh... Michael Lash will have to tell me. Maybe email me at Domhoff at UCSC and tell me who his nephew was at my. Uh, son was coaching he'll get a kick out of that yeah it was the samet boys one of the samets what say you say that larry samets uh, the samet boys oh great <laughs> oh great how fun uh, <laughs> sorry i didn't remember i uh i lose a lot of uh names these days uh even when i review i was reviewing like crazy on you know names of uh various authors and people and so on. But uh, hey, it was fun. It was um, um, a comfort level for me, obviously. And, and I appreciated your questions, your disagreements. Um, 
takes me, you know, I'll go look up some of these things. I, it makes me want to do what I've been thinking of doing, incidentally, was this book that failed, this myth of liberal ascendancy. I've, I've been thinking, I just got to write a big, long article on the key parts of it, of, you know, the day-by-day -day changes within this Committee for Economic Development, because you can just see this moderately conservative group becoming more and more conservative. Because one of the things they did, they for their own good, they taped their discussions. So I have some of the dialogues and discussions where this um, moderate Keynesian economist named Frank Schiff, who was hired by the Committee for Economic Development, he comes up against um, the guy that's still around. Uh, he's the uh, Summers. Summers or one, or, or no, the other Harvard guy. Anyway, it's yeah, just a brutal exchange in which, you know, um, um, what's his name from Harvard, <laughs> the previous senior um, leader of the conservatives at Harvard. He just, you know, he says, you for that means you're for this. <laughs> you can just see the change in their views over a, a 10 year period. Uh, and that might answer the good question that was asked me, um, you know, by a person who clearly knew all the data on the eighties and changes. And, um, and I do agree that, you know, the other thing is deregulation, deregulation of finance started with the talk of deregulation of, of trucking and railroads and so on. And then only in the late seventies, did it get and because of credit cards and the whole shadow banking and then the reaganites picked all that up and volcker picked it up the volcker of course had worked on and off for chase manhattan bank and you know it was really a private sector guy so i i did you know so I, I appreciated his his the nature of his full analysis and just take me back to those things so it's okay so i know what people are thinking now they're not thinking like um hacker or um, hmm. Marty, David Marty Harvey, Felstein, so yeah. I'll figure out they're thinking right. like somebody else, and I'll give it a try. Anyway, okay. thanks Thank again. Thank you so much, Bill, and uh, we'll be in contact, and okay. we'll send you the, the recording of this. All right, thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks a lot. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Caitlin.